Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for financial advisors. Today's episode is How Simplicity Leads to Impactful Growth, Carl Richards' Advice for Advisors. It's a conversation with the industry thought leader, content creator, and certified financial planner. I'm Jason Diamond, and this is the Diamond Podcast for Financial Advisors. At Diamond Consultants, our mission is to help advisors live their best business life. We want every elite advisor to find exactly the right place for their business and their clients to thrive, whether it's at a wirehouse, a regional, boutique, or independent firm. As the industry's leading recruiters and consultants, we've transitioned more than a quarter of a trillion dollars in assets under management in the past decade, and each year, 25% of transitioning advisors who manage a billion dollars or more are our clients. If you'd like to talk, please feel free to give us a call at 908-879-1002. Are you a financial advisor who's curious about whether you're in the best place to serve clients or if there might be a better way to optimize your business for the future? Should I Stay or Should I Go is a new book that serves as a self-guided journey, walking you through the key steps that Diamond Consultants takes with our advisor clients, whether considering change or not. Visit diamond-consultants.com slash the book to learn more. There's a chasm that exists in everyone's life. It's a proverbial rift between what we know we should do and how we do it and what we actually do. The reality is that as humans, we can't always help ourselves. The good news is there are others around us who see these self-limiting behaviors for what they are and have developed ways to simplify the routines that leave us feeling stuck and repeating what can be less efficient actions. Carl Richards is one such person who has that unique vision because he too often felt mired in excess detail and complex processes and data and found a way to simplify it all. As someone who got his start in the big brokerage world and later made the leap to independence, Carl recognized there had to be a better way to communicate with clients, to drill down on long reports and share what was most meaningful to them. Today, in addition to being a certified financial planner, Carl shares his techniques with those in the wealth management world and beyond as an author, podcaster, and thought leader. It's advice around simplification and filling what he calls behavior gaps that is truly relevant to advisors and how they think about their own business lives and their communication with clients. So we're excited to have him on the show to talk more about his unique perspective and how you might apply it to your own life. It's fascinating stuff, so let's get to it. Carl, thanks so much for joining us. To start, can you just walk us through your background and what brought you to the world of, we'll call it wealth management, but I know your role is much broader than just wealth management. Thanks, Jason. That's a long story. I'll try to make it short. In college, when I was an undeclared major, I went to apply for a job that my wife had found for me, and we thought it was a security job. So I thought I was applying to be like a mall cop or a bouncer or something. And I got halfway through the interview. And they hadn't asked me about Kung Fu skills or self-defense. And they were asking me about stuff that I, I had like heard of, but I couldn't tell you what they were, stocks, bond. And I went back and reread the ad. It said security. <laughs> so, sorry, it said securities, not security. I made it through the interview, which tells you about the applicant pool and landed at Fidelity Investments National Call Center like two weeks later. And that was in 97. You get a sense of early tech bubble I thought it was going to be a police, a mall cop. I get there. I'm like, oh, this is a math job. <laughs> and then I get on the what Fidelity called the trading floor at the time. And my first experience was the day Netscape went public. And I remember walking onto that floor just being like, this is not math. Whatever this is, it's not math. And so that's how. And, and one thing led to another. I ended up at a big brokerage firm and left that big brokerage firm to go to another even bigger brokerage firm before I eventually left and went independent. Wow. Yeah. Talk about a happy accident. I hope you still have not needed your Kung Fu skills in your (laughs) current capacity. (laughs) This is true. (laughs) So I know even just from doing some research on your website, you wear a lot of different hats, content creator, podcaster, advisor, thought leader, doodler, which is one of my favorites. How do you define yourself? So if someone says, Carl, what do you do for a living? How do you answer that question? 
It depends on if I want to talk to them. Normally, I used to just say I'm a financial planner, and then that would just stop all conversation, as we all know. <laughs> now, I typically just say author, because that seems to be what people can relate to. My work, though, is what you're really asking, I think, is like my work increasingly is about how, helping people find meaning from money like sorting out this weird thing we call money and why we all behave the way we do with it. And that takes the form of a bunch of different artifacts. So that could be a book. It could be a podcast. It could be, I do a lot of industry speaking and consulting, but it's all generally around how do we make sense of this thing that we call money? Got it. So is it fair to say that you view those various media forms as almost like the arrows in your quiver for trying to tackle the question you just brought up? And we'll talk more about that because I'm interested in your thoughts on the meaning of money and how people ascribe meaning to money. But is that a fair statement that you're somewhat agnostic to the form? It's just about yeah, what allows yeah. you to express yourself best? Yeah, Jason, that's funny. That's the term I use, actually. I, we just call it, we really approach every project with the idea that we're artifact agnostic that will let the project drive the ultimate artifact because some things would be better as a book. Some things would be better as a three-day retreat at my house. We're more interested in the question and the project. And then after we get into the development phase, we'll say, "What? okay, what form should this take in the world? Yeah, I think that's spot on. All right, I have to ask because I think a lot of our audience is familiar with and fans of Michael Kitches. So can you tell us a little bit, how did you two get connected and what has that experience been like? We've known each other since a long time, like his first year in the business, my first year in the business, we met, we were on a panel together years and years and years ago. So we've been talking pretty regularly for, I would say 20 years. And then a while ago, I don't even know how long it is now. I approached him and just said, Hey, we should do, we should take some of these conversations and make them public. Like, why not just hit record? And he was like, okay, what should we call it? And I, we were like playing around with different ideas and we came up with Kitsis and Carl and we record twice a month. I told him I'd do 52. I was like, oh, I'm only going to do a year. I'll do 52 episodes because I love projects to have a start and an end. And I lost track, completely lost track. And I was like, Michael, I'm only doing 50 of these. Where are we? And he's like 107. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, you can't stop now. One of the things that's so fun about it is I feel a lot of tension with the way Michael views the world because of the way he makes decisions and the way he thinks through things are so different from the way I do it. And I just want to resolve the tension because that's what I do is take complex things and make them simple. And we've presented before and his slide will be 17 bullet points and my slide will be a hand-drawn sketch. <laughs> and so that tension is really create. I'm using that word in a, I don't mean it negatively at all. Like that tension is a real force for creativity between the two of us. So it's been really fun. Well, that was going to be my follow-up question to that. I'll use your word tension. Is that a necessary component of the creative genius process? Because I think it's pretty clear you guys have done some tremendous work together. Like it was that tension, a happy accident? Is it an unnecessary byproduct. Like, tell me how you think about that. Do you view it as we are successful because of it or in spite of it? Yeah, I guess it would, we could talk about it generally and specifically, but generally, specifically with on Kitsis and Carl, it's exactly the reason we wanted to do it. Like we presented together once mm -hmm. and I just remember the juxtaposition of our work was so dramatic that it was like, man, and I have massive respect for the way he does it. And it's, I have no interest in doing it that way. And I believe he would say he has massive respect for the way I do it. And he has no interest in doing it that way. So I think that that's a unique opportunity. And it's also grown on me because I am increasingly convinced that I know almost nothing. And so I love being in situations where I can be like, oh, it never occurred to me to approach it that way. Teach me about that. How did that occur to you? How did you come up with that idea? Then my favorite thing about that experience is I've turned it in, I've turned kitsis into a verb. I will say in presentations now, now, now you could kitsis this to death, <laughs> which means like analyze spreadsheet, <laughs> but I choose to feel my way through it. And Michael chooses to analyze his way through it. And they're both completely valid depending on how you're wired. So that's been really fun. Yeah, I love that. And I, you remind me, of, I think it's an Einstein quote, is that the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. And I think that's a really healthy perspective, especially for somebody like you who's so content is what you do, which is a good segue. Your newsletter is one of my favorites. And for those who aren't familiar, it's called Behavior Gap. Can you talk, why, do you, why is it called Behavior Gap? What do you mean by that term? Really early on, I was at a, just to keep names out of it, I was at a big brokerage firm that 
has a bull symbol is now owned by a bank. <laughs> and I was answering questions. I just noticed that clients would call in. Actually, no, the genesis of it was actually, I'm sorry, Jason, these are, this is the genesis of the sketches, which I can get to in a minute. But the genesis of the behavior gap was I had, I think, some of the best training in the world on the investment side of the business. And I was really interested in institutional consulting. I went off and got my SEMA designation back when it was called that. And I was working on my CFP. And I kept noticing, like I had this very detailed, and I'm sure many of your listeners will relate to this. I had this very detailed process for manager search and selection is what we used to call it back in the day. And it was basically just a, a, a series of spreadsheets, metrics, variables that you could measure. And out of the bottom would fall, let's say like a large cap value manager, and we would hire them. And then 18 months later, this weird thing would happen where they would show up on our fire criteria. Hmm. And it was 18 to 24 months. It's, and I went through like three or four cycles of that before I was like, this is so weird. I have the best training in the industry. I seem to have created a very detailed disciplined process for buying high and selling low and charging people money for it. That's not a very good business strategy. So I was about to leave the industry. What do you do when you don't know what to do with your life? You go to law school. So I was like, I'm going to go to law school. And then I ran across some of this research that it, like, it wasn't just kids from the hills in Utah. It was institutional firms. It was investment policy committees. Like We just naturally never choose an investment based on past performance. What's the first thing you do as an investment policy committee when you go to find a new investment? Look at past performance. Like, and so we naturally have this process where the average investor underperforms the average investment. And so I remember trying to explain that to someone and they were just looking at me with blurry eyes. And I was like, like this. And I drew a bar graph and there was a tall bar, if you can imagine, a tall bar that said investment return. And there was a shorter bar, a little bit shorter, not a lot shorter, not Dow bar shorter, because I'm not sure about that data, but a little bit shorter that said investor return. And it had a little picture of a person with a, a frowny face. And I labeled the difference between those two behavior gap. I was like, this gap could only be due to behavior. Initially, Jason, I labeled it emotional gap, which I'm really glad I changed it. So that was the origin of the behavior gap. Now it's grown, I, I think of it, not just in investment terms, but I think of it as any well-intentioned behavior that produces a suboptimal result. So that's how it came about. And I like too how you were self-aware and introspective enough that it actually stemmed from your own behavior gaps. Like that's not necessarily oh. a criticism. I think it's a reality. And I know we'll talk about this in a little when we talk about how people ascribe value to money. I think especially when it comes to finances, and I remember this even just from economics classes or finance classes in college, there are some real behavior gaps. So I want to talk a little bit about some specific behavior gaps that you see commonly, but you've alluded to your sketches now. And they're probably my favorite thing that you do. I'm a visual person myself. So can you talk about, first of all, maybe just for those who aren't familiar, explain what they are. I've heard you refer to them as conversation grenades, which I think is a brilliant term. But can you talk a little more about your sketches? Yeah. So imagine, and again, I bet knowing your audience, I bet most of them can relate to this. Like think back to early, and it may have happened even later in your career, multiple times a day to you. But certainly early in your career, you can think back to sitting in the conference room with some clients or prospective clients, super smart people. This was my experience. He was an emergency room doctor and she was a technical sales rep, both very smart, successful people. And I was trying to explain a concept that I thought was really important for them to understand. I can't remember what it was, but it was a concept I thought, man, they need to understand this in order to make the decision that we're about to make. And I was just getting blank stares. And I remember like this kind of this feeling of desperation and I wasn't a doodler in high school. I have no art background, as will be obvious when you look at the sketches. I took a pottery class when I was eight. So I just remember this feeling of desperation, almost like, I got it. And I was like, man, I thought I was good at this, but I'm just getting blank stares. Knowing that they were successful and super smart, I was like, the problem must be me. And I was like, out of an act of desperation, I stood up for the first time in this conference room and there was a whiteboard and I just drew what I was talking about on the whiteboard. And it was like a circle with an arrow and a square. As I recall, it was like, you're going to save a bunch of money. And then at some point, we're going to switch the flow of that in distribution phase and it's going to switch. And I think I just drew that. So here's some arrows that's going in. Here's some arrows that's coming out. 
as basic as it was, I remember to this day the feeling in the room, which was, and they said, oh, I get it now. And I remember being like really surprised and addicted to that moment of like, oh, wow. And then, of course, all the research, as you alluded to, like visual learners, like something like 80% of us identify as visuals at least helping us learn, at least, and some of us as our primary way, but only like 20% of us are comfortable creating visuals, which is really interesting. So there's a huge, talk about a huge opportunity gap if you decide to jump in there. So anyway, that a couple weeks later, as I recall, I did the same thing with another client and he got home and called me and said, hey, that thing you drew on the board, I'm trying to explain it to my spouse. Would you mind? And I can't remember if it was fax or scanner back then. I can't remember where we were at this point. But he's like, would you mind sending it to me? And I remember when it went out, I again, remember this distinct moment. And I want to be clear here. I didn't think it was going to lead to anything. Like I'm a, I'm not a big fan of these cute stories we all make up about our success. But I remember the moment of saying to myself, oh, look, there it goes out into the ether. I could send this to other people. I just remember that thought. I was like, oh, you know what? I'll send this to my 10 friends. And that led to the creation of the website, behaviorapp.com. And every time I got a question more than once, that was my rule. If I got a question more than once, I would write my answer out and then I would try to illustrate it. And I do think of them as two things. Shortcut, I think of the sketches as a shortcut into an idea and then a souvenir. So when done well, they're shortcuts and souvenirs, a souvenir of the learning experience. And that's largely why I did them is because I don't have a lot of mental RAM. So I love to dive deep into problems, nuance, edge case, exceptions, really. But I, as soon as I can, I want to wrap all that experience up in a logo, if you will. And then I can free up that mental RAM for the next problem. So and then the way, just to give you the rest of the story, after doing that for a couple of years where it was really only my mom and my sister reading my website, I'm pretty sure my sister was lying. Like It was just my mom. After a couple of years of that, just playing in traffic, not, I had no plan. Come on, there, none of this was planned. I got an email from, and I keep the email. I show it at speaking engagements because nobody believes me. But I got an email from, the editor at the New York Times that said, hey, I love these. Would you consider doing them for us? Now that you know the security guard background story, you'd know, like I know from my security guard background to say yes and figure that out later. And that led to writing that column every week for 10, I think I missed three weeks in 10 years. It's incredible. By the way, Carl is being humble here. The sketches are brilliant in their simplicity. I relate so much to this story. My staff mocks me because whenever I am sitting down to do a teach piece or a coaching session, I bring a white legal pad and I go through, pro and close your ears for the eco warriors, I probably go through 30 pages of scratch paper, just drawing like really simplistic flow chart type diagrams. And I agree with you. It's amazing how much it changes the story. You literally see people's lights or eyes light up like, oh, that actually makes sense to me. And so we'll link to the to the website so people can check them out. But I want to pivot now. Our audience is primarily financial advisors and they sit in various industry channels. But and I, I do think financial advisors can absolutely benefit from many of your sketches as far as you know simplifying complex ideas to clients. But back to this topic of behavior gaps. When you think about the financial advisor marketplace as it exists today, give me it from both perspectives. What are the behavior gaps that you see advisors have? And then what are the behavior gaps that you commonly see their clients have? Yeah, it's a great question. Advisors, it's pretty clear to me what I see. I don't know if I'm right about it. <laughs> I'm often wrong, but never in doubt. Let's put it that way. I really believe that the biggest behavior gap, if you will, is a misunderstanding of where your value actually is as an advisor. We think that we're getting paid for solutions mm -hmm. and we're not. We're getting paid to understand other people's problems. No one cares about your fancy solutions. They care about their problems. Now, that doesn't mean... <laughs> Sometimes I get accused of downplaying the technical piece of our job 
the technical stuff is table stakes at this point. Of course, you have to be able to go toe to toe with people on the solutions. Of course. Totally agree. And I felt like I could defend my, especially like the investment process all day long against anyone. And this is the other thing. We all have to be adults about this. We have to be able to hold two competing truths in our minds at the same time. And the two I'm asking you to hold in your mind, just to consider, like just to consider, is the technical solutions you provide are insanely important and, not but, and they don't matter at all if you haven't heard the client. And so I think our value is much more in goal clarification, understanding why clients are doing things, helping them understand that this is just a never ending. Financial planning is the never ending process of aligning your use of capital. And I think of capital as meta, money, energy, time, and attention. So four sources of capital. Your use of capital with what's important to you. That's one of my most popular Venn diagrams. It, use of capital in one circle, what's important to you in the other, the overlap labeled real financial advice. That's what we get paid for, not the solutions. And I know no one, unless the world's changed in the last 24 hours, no one comes to your office saying, can I cry on your couch? They come because they've got a presenting problem. And that problem often, for many of your audience, that problem often is investment performance related. So the job becomes like, let's greet them with empathy at that spot. But then slowly, I call it pull righteous tricks. Righteous tricks are always to the benefit of the client, never bait and switch. They're just always to the benefit. Pull a series of righteous tricks to help them understand what they thought they were getting from you was investment, really quality investment process. And guess what? They did get that, but it's not really what they value. What they value is the ladder's leaning against the right wall now, to paraphrase a Covey quote. So that's the one I think I see advisors making the most is like not understanding the massive, because if you're an advisor right now and you still think the solutions are your value, there's a massive self-esteem problem in our industry because we don't understand the massive value. If people really knew what you did, there'd be a line outside your door. But you're reading articles about how robos and whatever else, everything, AI, everything else, pick whatever year you want to pick. Something's going to replace you because you have no value. That's because we've been placing all our value on something that's become a commodity. What's not a commodity is matching the human and all its unique quirks of every individual client to that investment process. And that I don't know how that will ever be replaced. First of all, I think your answer is brilliant and spot on. There's an interesting piece of this that you didn't mention, either because you don't agree with what I'm about to say or because it's a little bit of an awkward sentiment, which is that there's an additional layer to this that a lot of advisors, if not most advisors, are also not particularly good at the solutions or the investment side of things. And I think that all opens advisors up to probably an uncomfortable conversation that most don't want to have. So I get asked about this a lot by my friends of, can you recommend an advisor for me or should I use an advisor? And well, of course, my answer is always yes. I caveat it. If what you're looking for is somebody to beat the S&P 500 on a regular basis, you very well might be disappointed. Is that a fair sentiment? Yeah, I think and I think one of the things that points me to is like, I really do believe that we've got to be technical rock stars. Knowing how to calculate a amortization table on a mortgage might be an important skill. Knowing how to anal- knowing how to explain like what is volatility? <laughs> Do you understand standard deviation? Whatever it is your area of focus, like knowing it, one thing I, that drives me crazy and I think is a real problem in our industry is people who should be selling shoes calling themselves financial advisors. Well, that's a big problem. But I run into a lot of really technically super solid folks and But they haven't placed their value on your question. Beating the S&P 500 is a whole different question because whatever the number is, let's just go with 85% of the people who focus on that all day long can't do it. Right. And so if you set that aside as part of your value and you just say, look, investment performance is incredibly important because it's one of the drivers of meeting your goals. Of course it's important. We care deeply about it. And... Would it be okay if we back up a little bit and talk about why do you think you need $5 million in a sailboat? Mm. Have you ever been on a sailboat? Like <laughs> if we start coaching people through that process to get the ladder leaning up against the right wall, 
then investment performance honestly becomes an afterthought. And when it comes up, you can go toe to toe. Like, let me walk you through why we aren't focused on beating the S&P 500 or whatever it is your measure. But remember, investment performance is much more key, a function of behavior than skill. So the job of the investment process is really to find the investment process that will give you the greatest likelihood of good behavior, not of beating an index. Yeah. And I liken it, the analogy we kind of use for this, and it's in a similar realm, is a firm. So from a firm perspective, when a firm is recruiting advisors, technology and investment platform are important, right? Of course they are. When the advisor logs on to the desktop in the morning, the thing needs to work. But I use the same term you just used. That's table stakes. And that's not a but. It's not technology is important, but it's technology and platform are important and, right? Firms need to deliver on much more than that today because that has become increasingly table stakes. And if it's not, you're probably not a very good firm. For sure. Tell me about now from the client perspective. So meaning end clients. And I know you have, you've been an advisor at various points in your career yourself. So you obviously have a unique lens into this. What are the behavior gaps that you most commonly run into with clients? Look, I think we need to be far more empathetic as an industry. It's just interesting. I've noticed over the years as we got more into behavioral finance, there was this smugness that sort of <laughs> got in. Like we would look down at those silly humans behaving the way they are and think like, oh, silly human if they just knew Daniel Kahneman's work or something. So if with that caveat, because I think what that leads us to is we understand that these the way we all interact with money and we can go far beyond just the investment process for this discussion, but it makes a lot of sense if you understand the way we're wired, right? Like if you were, I can't remember who said it, but if you were to design a poor investor, you would design a human. And MBA 101 teaches you if you have two divisions, one's doing poorly and the other is doing well, you kill the one that's doing poorly and you reinvest the resources in the one that's doing well. If you're going to hire a new coach, football coach at Auburn, of course, it makes sense to look at the past track record and reasonable to expect that to continue. So I think if we understand having empathy for clients, then we can still talk in these terms. Like one of the greatest mistakes you see clients make is thinking that a successful relationship with an advisor is about finding the best investment. And we understand why they make that mistake because I make that mistake. Like all you have to do is listen to the news. The Financial Pornography Network trains you to make that mistake. For 10 years at the New York Times, one of my goals was to help investors understand, don't go to the advisor for investment performance. Go to the advisor that helps you understand why you're doing it in the first place. The biggest mistake I see clients is this kind of unreasonable, and I'm just in the most gentle of terms, like uneducated view of the role of an advisor and this focus on investment performance and thinking that's the job. That's probably the biggest mistake. Making those investment decisions in isolation and not understanding that not only is proper portfolio science about the combination of asset of investments, but your portfolio's only job is to help you reach your goals. And so it all backs up to why are you doing this in the first place? I like how you started your answer around empathy. And I'm guilty of this too, by the way, when we talk to our advisor clients, and I think advisors are in turn guilty of this with their end clients, is that we're dealing with a lot of really smart people. But that's not to say that they're necessarily smart in the same way that you're smart. Like I had an example, I was talking to an advisor probably a couple months ago now, and he used the example that a client came into his office and the advisor was trying to explain just the basic 60-40 portfolio. And the client was a smart guy, he was a doctor, and just couldn't get it. And the advisor was getting more and more frustrated, more and more frustrated, and the client picked up on it. And he said, John, your right bicuspid has some recession on it or something like that. And he was making a joke. But the point was, when I speak in my technical dental speak, you don't understand it. And that doesn't mean that you're stupid. It just means that we grew up in different places. And I think it's an interesting way to take a step and say, remember where these people are coming from. They're not coming from the same background, the same training. They don't think about money the same way you do. They're probably not as jaded to a lot of the jargon. And so I think it was interesting how you said it. I totally agree. Empathy is probably where a lot of that starts. For sure. Yeah. All right. Let's talk a little bit about, obviously in 2024, you can't go two seconds without seeing some form of content, right? My wife is swiping TikTok and Instagram all day. We've got articles, podcasts, videos, 
anyone with a laptop and a microphone can be an author or a podcast host. Is that a good thing? Like, let's, And keep it through the lens of wealth management. How should advisors think about content and marketing strategies given how crowded the pool has gotten? I think it's pretty simple, not to be confused with easy, but pretty simple. I think the measurement device should be relevance. Another way to think about this is, can you figure out how to be the signal amid all the noise? And one way to frame that would be relevance. So I still open emails that are relevant to me. Typically, I can make that judgment call by either A, the source, the to line, the from line in my inbox, or the subject line. If I open it, I can make it quickly within a sentence. Is it relevant? And so I think that really narrows you down to understanding everyone doesn't exist. So creating content for everyone is a waste of time and you're just adding to the massive content pollution we already have in the problem. It's like turning on your lights at night. Everybody in the street, now you're adding to the light pollution. (laughs) And I just think we should stop it. What you should do instead, if you want to have success with this, I think this is true unless you're a international brand who should be buying Super Bowl ads. And I just spent the weekend down in, in the desert of Southern Utah with two people who are some of the world's experts on branding. And the big question we were talking about was, does branding work even for them? Like we were talking about examples of like Ford and Coke. But unless you're in that discussion, the question is, who is it for and what does it do? If you can't answer that question, I would just stop until you can answer that question. And I think the shortcut to relevance, this is why you hear the industry talk so much about it, the shortcut to relevance is through occupation. Now, that doesn't mean it's the only way. It just means it's through. It could be through a hobby. It could be through a specific financial challenge. It could be through a geographic location, people who retire in South Florida, or maybe even a tax issue. But the shortcut into relevance is occupation. So now if you follow that thread all the way through, you're like, okay, I'm going to start a weekly newsletter, but I need to know who it's for. And the narrower, the better. Like I could give you some crazy narrow examples that have been massively, like how many clients do you need? A hundred? Two hundred? Yeah. I've got a friend who only markets to senior executives at a large publicly traded company, I just won't mention it, of Indian descent. So they they have to be a senior executive at that company of Indian descent. Guess what? The people he writes for, they open his emails. Yeah, I bet. And I bet that's enough of a pool for him too to fish in because to your Uh, point, he's got more than he needs. So targeted, it sounds like, is your solution to this problem. Is the more targeted, the better is probably one way to think about this. It's the only way I would think about it in terms of when you're talking about it. If your goal is to build your firm and or just like have a bigger impact, the goal is to start as small and narrow as possible. Let me take a cynical view here. And I think you're well equipped to answer this because you've been both an advisor and a thought leader. To your point earlier about clients maybe misunderstanding the core value prop of what you do, do you ever hear from clients or hear from colleagues of yours who hear from clients that clients view thought leadership as a negative. Like I I use Michael as a good example of this. He's obviously so prolific. I would be worried if I was a client of Michael's of how is Michael going to spend time focusing on me and worrying about me? I would be surprised if somebody could run an RA firm or their own book of business while doing Michael's job. So I think that it's a different job. So I think matching the way I would solve, yes, that's a valid concern. And the way I'd solve that is matching the type of content you're creating to the job you're doing. So here's an easy way to think about this. Here's a super easy way to think about this. What if you, and this, I've been suggesting this for years. What if if you read, you're a financial advisor who reads, the answer is yes. Do you think about what you read? Yes. What if you just wrote down? So just get a little notepad. You could use something. I use this crazy, really technically advanced app on my iPhone called Notes. It's really wild. <laughs> Me too. And when I'm reading something, I will just pull up a note and I will dictate now because the dictation's so great. The transcription's so great. I'll just dictate my thought, a thought or two. And at the end of the week, and I could tell you right now, I could tell you in 10 seconds, notes, folders. I have this crazy folder. I do a daily podcast. 
I just recorded episode 1,157. You're going to give our marketing department a heart attack here talking like that. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the podcast ideas, my podcast idea folder, I do one every day. I've been doing it for 1,157 episodes. My podcast idea folder has 184 notes in it. Wow. So when I go to record the episode, so you're an advisor, you read things, you write down little notes. Once a week, you pull out your notebook and you maybe you have 20 things in there. Pick the three that you think would be most helpful to your clients. And if there aren't three, do two. If there aren't two, do one. Pull up your email system, write three things that I think will help you this week. And if all you, and then view it through the lens of their unique problems. So back to the relevance lens, write Literally, you could say, here's three things I read. I have advisors who've been doing this for 12 years and they'll tell you it's the greatest marketing thing they've ever done. And it's not great for the first year or two, but then it becomes massively great. It compounds. And all they do is literally say, here's an article about this. Here's an article about this. Here's an article about this. And what happens over time is you add a sentence or two of what you think. I like this article because of this. Then some of them add a paragraph of what they think. And that's what they send out. And then the clients say, oh my gosh, it's so great because I, I don't have to worry about anything else. I know if it's important, it will end up in your email. I know, man, I found so much valuable in that article you sent about the lady who climbed Mount Everest. That to me is the simple way to do it. And nobody's going to say, how are you doing your job while putting this together? It's just a byproduct. This is my, I'm a huge fan of byproduct. It's a byproduct of what you're already doing and you just do it in public. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I will say, so one of the things that this, I don't know if worried is the right word, but the first thing that came to my mind is as you're talking, a lot of what you're describing feels a lot easier and more achievable for an advisor who plays in the independent space, whether it's an independent broker dealer, an IAR, or somebody who has their own RIA. But a lot of our audience, as I mentioned to you before we began here, is wirehouse folks. And obviously they play in a more limited sandbox by definition. And there are some guardrails about what they're allowed to do content wise, marketing wise, and you've spent some time in the wirehouse world. So I'm not telling you anything you don't know. What are those guys supposed to do? Is it just, you got to deal with it or get out of there or are there strategies? No, no, no. no, I love it. I love it. And I'm a, by the way, like still have nothing but fond memories of my experience there and really shaped me for my whole industry. I'm super grateful. So, and some of my favorite advisors are still in that environment. Here's what I did. And I think you can still do this. I used to set aside and I would set aside like a half an hour a day. I would read and then I would stare at the, a list of my favorite clients and or prospective clients. And I would think about, was there something I read today that would help Jill? Was there something I read? And then I would just send an individual email. Hey, Jill, thinking about you today, thought you might enjoy this article. And I don't know if that still passes the rules, but it certainly did when I was there. They were almost never, by the way, investment performance. So it was almost never that. It was some like, okay, Jill sold giant servers for EMC. And I read something about human performance and just being the best you could. And so I sent Jill this note. So I was always thinking like, how could I just add value, especially in the context of their lives? And that's actually how my weekly newsletter started is because I started sending that to, I was doing that to so many different people. They would say, hey, can I send it to my friend? And I was like, and so I went, and I don't know what the rules are now, but I was able to do that in, more, in a more bulk form. But it wasn't using some email list. It wasn't some form. It was just, Jill, I was thinking about you. Yeah, started organically. I like yeah. that. And I, again, if you just did, how many clients do you need, right? If you just said, this is the thing I think we just, told, I know I undervalue it. If you did 10 of those a day for the next five years of your life, you would never have to work again. <laughs> yeah. In terms of marketing, like... Because you just don't understand the power of, we all heard those stories. Like I remember hearing these stories of guys that would send three handwritten notes a day. If you just thoughtfully sent five emails a day, thoughtfully that added value to people's lives, the compounding downstream of that effect of that, of them sending it to somebody and them sending it to somebody and then somebody, and even if they don't share it, you did that for three years. Anyway, I just get super fired up about that stuff. 
I think that's a really good answer. And I will say, fair, the world has probably changed a little bit since you were in the nameless blue bull firm that shall remain nameless. But it's become, I think, a little bit of a driver of movement in some cases. Like, fine, you do what's acceptable and permissible and compliant within the four walls of a wirehouse. If it becomes an important enough strategy for you, or if you want it to become a more meaningful strategy for you going forward, we've absolutely seen advisors make a change to solve for just that. I want to do a podcast. I want to be able to send videos to my yeah. clients. So yeah. not supposed to be an advertisement for movement by any stretch, but the reality is there's probably a case to be made that in this one realm, content creation, marketing, communicating with clients, the independent space is a broader and more flexible sandbox. I think you'd agree. That's why I ended up having to leave. Was yep. I had to choose? Are you going to write the New York Times column or are you not? Yep, absolutely. All right, I have to ask this question. This was the very first question that I came up with when I learned I was interviewing you, which has been a pleasure, by the way. I've listened to your podcast now for some time and you always ask guests what money means to them. What is the best answer? And you don't have to give me just one if you have multiple in mind. What are some of the best answers you've heard to that question? Yeah, so many good ones. The one that comes to mind first is, I believe his name is Dean Norris. He played, who was the guy that on Breaking Bad, the bald cop, whatever his, whatever the guy's name was. I do remember who you're talking about. I know who Dean Norris the is. The actor is Dean Norris. Hank, I by the way, was, I just thought of Yeah, him. Hank, that's Hank. right, that's right. Hank on Breaking Bad. He, when I asked him, so this is on the 50 Fires podcast that I'm working on with Chip and Joanna Gaines at Magnolia. They, they're the executive producers. And I interview some people that you'd really for sure know and other people that you'd never heard of, but that are really thoughtful. And Dean Norris, I asked him what money meant to, means to him. And he said, the number of months I can go without working. I love that. And Me I too. said, when, whoa, when did you? And he was like, really early on. He was like, literally, like when I first moved to LA and I was living on the sleeping on friends' couches, I started thinking, oh man, I can go a month. And, and he said, it wasn't about not working. It was a, a month between gigs. And I've got other friends who answer that question by saying it's the amount of time I can climb. Like literally, I'm going to work until I have enough money saved and I'm going to go climbing. And I'll come back when I've, I've run out of money. But that's not what Dean was saying. Dean was saying like it would give me flexibility to say no to certain gigs. Like it's the number of months I can go between phone calls from my agent. I thought that was great. Now, Chip Gaines, Chip said it's impact on other people, a tool for impact. Mm -hmm. He's like, it was, it's, this is just a tool. That's like, it's all I really care about. It's just a tool. Like, can I go, that guy is broken down on the side of the road. Can I go help him fix his tire? And if he needs a new one, I'm going to buy it for him. That's all he ever thinks about is money being a tool for impact. There was a Dexter Fowler. He said what money meant to him was his ability to make a difference for his kids. So I, I love when people connect the idea that money is the tool and money is the means yeah, and not the end. And when the tool starts to use you, <laughs> you're in a little bit of trouble. So those are some of my favorite answers. Yeah, those are great answers. I'm watching uh, a less serious show than the one you just mentioned with my wife right now. We're watching Emily in Paris and we just rewatched the first season and one of the characters makes the comment, I think he says it in like, you Americans live to work and we work to live. Or I said that backwards, but. Can I comment on that real quick? Yeah, we please. spent four, four years living in New Zealand and we've just been back for three years now. And it was four years in New Zealand and a year in London. And I was blown away by when I'd come back. The, and, and by the way, I'm not saying this is a bad thing. It's produced some amazing ingenuity and hardworking and competitiveness. That's great. But the organizing function, the organizing force of life, largely for many of us in America, is work and money. And one example of this is like six months into us living in New Zealand, I had a friend there that was like, he, I said, to, he introduced me to somebody. He's like, oh, what do you do for a living? And my buddy afterwards pulled me aside. and was like, mate, how long are you going to ask that question? <laughs> He's like, we don't ask that question here. Ask him what he did on the weekend. Ask him about his kids. Ask him about what he likes to do his hobbies. But we don't ask that question. It's like, that's so fascinating. That is I fascinating. We, yeah. When you start to see it, it's hard to unsee. But if you start to unravel it a little bit of like, we just organized a trip. I do these like retreats and trips with financial advisors and venture and hedge fund folks that people who take risk for a living. That's we take people out on these trips. It's called Dancing with Dragons. And we just did one that was resume-less. So you couldn't talk or ask about work. 
And oh my gosh, you should have seen the first hour of that. A lot of weather talk. Yeah, the stumbling around, but <laughs> oh man, the last two days, things got so real and so beautiful and we're friends for the rest of our lives because of it. So anyway, that's a, just a short commentary on it. So let me wrap up. This has been a real pleasure. Any final parting words of wisdom or advice for our audience, who again is financial advisors? I would say is please understand the value of what you do. This to me has come home in every episode of that podcast, 50 Fires, that I do, I'm reminded and I'm pointing out the window right now. Like the people out there need you more than they've ever needed you before. Because I don't know if the world is more uncertain, but it absolutely feels more uncertain than it's ever felt before. And if you can just keep that in mind and realize that the solution to feeling like you may be replaced by technology is to be more human, to like lean more into that and start to understand that your job is not to defend an outdated map. Your job is to help people really to be a guide in a changing landscape. And if you understand that, the type of training you get, the type of books you read, the type of skills you want to develop, they become much more about navigating uncertainty, looking people in the eyes with incomplete information and giving them answers. Like, what does that take in terms of resilience? What does that take in terms of your own health and your own mental fortitude? And if you remember all of that, and to me, it's all like at the center of all of it is this crazy, I gave, Jason, I gave myself I appointed myself vice president of unspeakable things about 10 years ago in our industry. And so I'm now allowed to say like at the center of that is love for these people that we get to help make more aligned decisions. And if you do that, the thing I love about advisors is they're doing that for 50, 100, 150 people. Imagine the compounding impact of our industry. Think about this as the closing thought. A million, 2 million, 5 million, 20 million people having conversations around a dinner table that are more thoughtful and more secure with their kids because of the work you've done. Like if we just all hold that, the rest of this stuff will come to us. Definitely a powerful image. Well, thank you so much, Carl. This has been an absolute pleasure. You've given us some gold and some really valuable insight. So I really appreciate the time and I look forward to having you back in future years. Yeah. Cheers, Jason. That was really fun. As a financial advisor, you hold yourself to the highest standards of integrity, honesty, and credibility. You are successful because you take your professional responsibility seriously and are dedicated to your clients. But are you living your best business life? Are your goals aligned with your firms or could a better option exist? Should I Stay or Should I Go is a book written with you in mind. It's a self-guided journey that walks you through the key steps that we take with our advisor clients. This strategic thought process and roadmap to professional self-discovery is designed to help you ask the right questions and think critically and objectively, whether you're considering change or not. Learn how to get your copy at diamond-consultants.com slash the book.